Uh, for our final talk of the day in this session, uh, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Arkin Tiku, uh, who will tell us about circular overbounds. Uh, uh, the floor is yours, Arkin. All right, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak this year at TQC. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but hopefully this will do. Um, so today I'll be talking about some joint work that I did with Isaac Kim on trying to understand the limitations of quantum computing in the near term using tools from quantum mini body physics. So first, uh, let me give you a brief summary of our results. So we proved a hardness result on the preparation of the low energy states of lattice Hamiltonians in 2D. In particular, we were focusing on lattice Hamiltonians whose ground space exhibits some form of long range entanglement, sometimes also referred to as topological order. And our work was partly motivated by a lot of the work that has been happening in the field of variational quantum algorithms, which are algorithms that are geared towards near-term devices um, and are trying to bridge or trying to make near-term devices useful for tasks like, say, ground state preparation or ground energy estimation. And one of the uh, sort of key corollaries of our results is that, in general, for methods like these, one cannot expect a exponentially fast convergence to solution. Hopefully this will be of interest to practitioners in that field. So first, let me give you a brief outline of this talk. First, I'll be uh, giving you a brief review of quantum computing in the term and the variation quantum eigen solver. Then I'll state our main results and I'll uh, give you a brief outline of our proof. And then I'll dive into some of the details behind the proof techniques, and then I'll conclude with some discussion and an open question. So we all know that the quantum devices that are currently around are still fairly limited. They have very few qubits, they're very noisy, and when it comes to superconducting qubits, they still suffer from things like very limited connectivity, which is just limited to some 2D nearest neighbor architecture. And furthermore, adaptive circuits are still very difficult to implement. And so given those limitations, one may ask, what can we do with these devices in the near term? And uh, one of the most common tasks to consider is the preparation of ground states of local Hamiltonians. These are Hamiltonians where each interaction only acts on a bounded number of qubits. Uh, the most common way of doing this with a near-term device is using the so-called variational quantum eigensolver. The variational quantum eigensolver is a hybrid quantum classical algorithm um, that addresses the following task. Say somebody hands you a local Hamiltonian that is written in the Pauli basis. Then your goal is to approximate or compute the lowest eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian using some variational unsat state. You want to do this using a quantum computer that prepares this unsat state and a classical optimizer that allows you to variationally optimize over those parameters. The way that the algorithm proceeds is that you start off in some product state, and then you apply this variational circuit unsats, which is some predefined circuit uh, with continuous parameters onto the state. This then gives you your, your variational trial unsat state, which is then measured in some particular basis. And this, the outcome of this measurement is then feed forwarded to some classical uh, to some classical device that evaluates the expectation value of this trial onset state with respect to your local Hamiltonian. This outcome is then feed forward to the optimizer, which then updates your parameters such that the energy of this trial onset state with respect to your local Hamiltonian is lowered for the next round of trial onset preparation. You then simply repeat this process until you, until you hit some plateau energy, after which you need to increase the depth of your onset circuit. And you then re repeat this procedure until you've reached some onset state that is close enough to your ground state. Now, of course, one may ask, given a particular target energy density of the trial onset state, how deep must such a circuit actually be? Can we expect that the energy density of this onset state decays polynomially with the depth of the circuit onsets, or does it just decay, or does it even decay exponentially, which would be favorable? 
Of course, this will depend on the type of lattice model that we're considering. And so one may ask, what sort of behavior between these two can we expect for some interesting lattice models? Now, the particular lattice models that we were looking at, as I said before, were topologically ordered lattice models in two dimensions. Um, and also we have a uh, assumption on the structure of the ground space, namely we assume that they're frustration free, namely that the uh, that the local that the global ground state is also a ground state of all the local subspaces of all the local a ground state of all the local terms. Furthermore, we assume that we're preparing our low energy state only using geometrically local gates on some 2D architecture. And furthermore, we will not allow for adaptive gates. So gates that uh, or adaptive circuits, which means we're not allowing for a mid-circuit measurement uh, and feed forward. Now the task at hand will be, given some global energy density epsilon, we would like to prepare some uh, state rho that whose energy density is at most epsilon. Now our main result is that in the worst case, one can only hope to prepare such a low energy state row epsilon using a circuit of depth uh, polynomially in one over epsilon. Now, a fine print, of course, is that, you know, given that we're starting with some pure product state, uh, we cannot prepare some mixed state just using a circuit. And so we're really talking here about the purification complexity of some purification psi epsilon. Okay, so how do we prove this main result? Well, the proof basically follows in three separate steps. First, we show that any low energy state rho epsilon locally is close to the local ground space of our target Hamiltonian. In other words, if you consider a small enough patch R of the global lattice, then rho epsilon essentially looks like the local ground state on this patch. Now, we'll combine this together with a generalization of some type of witness function for the presence of long range entanglement in the ground state of such a model. This witness function was introduced by Zhang Wenha in 2013 and was used to prove a circuit depth lower bound for the preparation of ground states of such models. Now we'll combine this with the insight that our low energy state locally looks like a ground state. This will be the key trick behind our proof technique. I should say that this witness function, uh, you know, might at first sight look a bit mysterious, but in some sense, it is physically inspired by the non-trivial braiding statistics of the excitations that you will find in these types of models. Uh, these are sometimes related, uh, referred to as any odds. Now, the way that we arrive at our circuit double or bound by combining these two key ingredients is by putting upper and lower bounds on this witness function for our low energy state. Uh, we'll show how one can upper bound this witness function evaluated for our low energy state rho epsilon in terms of the circuit depth and how one can lower bound it in terms of a function uh, that is a function of the inverse energy density of rho. Now these upper and lower bounds are both polynomial which then leads us to a circuit depth lower bound of square root of one over epsilon for our low energy state. Now, let me dive a little bit more into uh, all of these three key points. So as I said before, um, the first step will be to show that locally for your global lattice lambda on which your Hamiltonian is defined, um, any small enough patch of this lattice, of this lattice uh, looks like the ground state of your model. Now, what do I mean by this? So we know that the condition on our low energy state rho epsilon is that um, its, its global energy density is at most epsilon. What this means, in other words, is that the total energy on any such patch is upper bounded by the patch size times the energy density. This is simply by definition. One can then show that any projection onto the ground space locally of the restricted Hamiltonian supported only on patch R essentially acts like a a gentle measurement on our low energy state rho. Uh, this then allows us to bound the trace distance off the unperturbed low energy state rho epsilon to the low energy state rho epsilon that has been projected locally 
onto the ground space of the restricted Hamiltonian HR. Now this then allows us to essentially get as close as we like to the local ground space, simply by making the patch size as small as we need. Now, the second step was to leverage this idea of the twist product. Now, the twist product is uh, essentially just an algebraic construction and a generalization of the regular operator product. Now, in order to give you some intuition, let's consider the following setup. Let's consider some two-dimensional lattice and two operators, which are loop-like, which we shall refer to, to as P and Q. Now, these operators are bipartite op bi operators on this lattice, if we were to consider some bar partitioning of the lattice into the upper half and the lower half, called M and M complement. Now, the way to define the twist product is by simply taking a Schmidt decomposition of both of these bipartite operators, P and Q, between the upper and the lower half of the plane, such as this. Now here, the operators PJ and QK simply denote operator bases for each half of the plane. The way to then take the twist product is by taking the product of the basis operators on one half of the plane in one ordering and reversing the order of multiplication on the other half of the plane, such as written here. To give you an intuition of how the twist product then relates to the regular operator product, let's consider two loop-like operators on some 2D lattice uh, and for, for, for simplicity, let's consider these to be Tori code stabilizers, one X-type stabilizer and one Z-type stabilizer. What happens if we take the twist product between these two? Well, if we write it down more clearly, given the fact that the Tori code stabilizers are simply single side, uh, are simply tensor products of single side poly operators, uh, we can rewrite it such that you simply have a a uh, regular product between the X-type and the Z-type operators on one half of the plane um, and the reverse ordering on the other half of the plane. Now, simply, uh, now each one of those halves is a product between operators that are not stabilizers. Therefore, these will anti-commute and we can simply commute the X part uh, through the Z part and pick up a minus one sign and write it as the regular operator product between the X-type and the Z-type stabilizer together with a minus sign in front. Uh, physically, what this should remind you of is the braiding statistics of E and M particles in the Tori code. In other words, if you were to take an E-type particle and braid it around an M-type particle in the Tori code, the wave function of the ground state would pick up a minus one sign in front of it. So the twist product in some sense is an algebraic instantiation of the braiding operation. Now, in order to leverage the twist product successfully to prove our circuit doubler bound, we'll need an additional ingredient, which is so-called local invisibility. Local invisibility is a notion that should already be familiar to you from basic aspects of quantum error correction. The idea is a operator P is locally invisible with respect to some state psi or rho. If acting with P on the state rho locally, on a small, sufficiently small patch A doesn't change the state. So in other words, we talk about an operator P being exactly locally invisible. If after application on rho, um, rho is unchanged on a sufficiently small patch A. Now this is only a, uh, a very coarse grained uh, way of putting this. Uh, there's a more precise definition that you'll be able to find in the paper, but roughly speaking, this is the intuition. Now, the way that one can use this, uh, this, this particular property of op an operator uh, was, was shown in a paper by Zhang Wenha in 2013, where he proved the following lemma. So suppose you're given two locally invisible operators, P and Q, and a state Psi. Then if the twist product between P and Q and its expectation value with respect to Psi does not factorize in this way with respect to P and Q, then one then Psi cannot be prepared using a constant depth circuit. In other words, one can use the twist product between two locally invisible operators as a witness for the presence of topological order. 
since topological order is equivalent to uh, the inability of preparing the state psi under consideration from a product state using a constant depth circuit. Okay, so now that we've seen how to use this twist product of locally invisible operators for a ground state, let's see what we can do in the case of low energy states. In order to leverage this idea, we had to first define a kind of robust witness function, if you like, um, such that for uh, the operators that we're considering now, um, we could we can make use of that for our setting. So in other words, uh, define a function such as this, which looks a bit like a correlation function. Um, can you now use operators P and Q for our low energy state rho, where psi here would denote the purification of the low energy state? Now, it turns out that in order to uh, find pseudo operators P and Q for our setting, we need to relax this notion of local invisibility to only an approximate version. In other words, by acting with P on our state rho, we only require the state to approximately stay invariant under this action, say up to some uh, up to some sensitivity delta. Now, the basic idea will be, um, we already know of operators that are exactly locally invisible with respect to the ground state of the Tori code, but finding such operators with respect to low energy states in general seems intractable. However, as I've told you before, locally our low energy state actually looks like the ground state of the Tori code. We will leverage this idea and show that Tori code stabilizers are actually approximately locally visible with respect to our low energy state on the small patch R. So in other words, uh, we'll be able to use our Tori code stabilizers as approximately locally invisible operators in our correlation function. We'll then evaluate this correlation function with respect to our low energy state and prove upper and lower bounds on it. As I said before, the upper bound is in terms of the circuit depth and the lower bound is in terms of the inverse energy density. Both of these bounds are polynomial and we therefore arrive with a circuit depth lower bound for our low energy state that is also polynomially in one over epsilon. Now, uh, in summary, we therefore have shown a no-go result for the fast preparation of approximate ground states for topologically ordered models in 2D. And we've furthermore shown that for such models in general, we cannot expect an exponentially fast convergence to the solution and only a polynomial decay can be expected. Um, furthermore, uh, as an open question here, I'll just state that re more recently, um, a descriptive version of the variation quantum eigensolver has been proposed by Toby Qubit. Um, and we believe that our circuit of lower bound would still hold for this descriptive version of the VQE. But of course, making this argument rigorous will require some more work uh, and might be uh, interesting to some of you to work on. Um, furthermore, one of the more uh, technical aspects of our proof technique is that our results, our circuit of lower bound, is actually not dependent on the ground space degeneracy of the Hamiltonian. Uh, this is something that previous circuit of lower bound techniques for, say, uh, the, the NLTS theorem heavily rely on. Um, so in some sense, our technique can be understood um, as potentially something interesting to study when it comes to lifting that uh, degeneracy assumption um, on more exotic Hamiltonians that live on, on expander graphs. All right, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larkin, for the very interesting talk. Um, do we have questions? Okay, uh, while well, people are still thinking of a question, I have one to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you think this polynomial, uh, I guess, uh, one inverse polynomial lower bound on the circuit depth, do you think that could potentially be saturated? I mean, is there a connection to these uh, Kibo Zurich uh, scaling that people predict in physics? Um, so, I don't know if any like explicit examples where uh, it is saturated. I would 
I would think that it's pretty likely that it would be, but I can't give you any explicit examples for it. Um, but I also don't know what is the, what is this Kibble Zurich uh, phenomenon that we were talking about. Oh, so there, I guess uh, it refers to uh, if you do sort of a if you try to run the adiabatic algorithm, for example, uh, with finite mm -hmm. time, the energy density scales like inverse polynomially with a with a time. Uh, right. But this is for very specific like you know systems. Uh, I guess I was wondering if you know anything. Like, because you proved your theorem for the Tory code, if there's any idea how yeah. to actually prepare epsilon approximate states with these local circuits in polynomial depth, I guess. That's an, right. I think that's a, seems to be an open question there. Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Well, uh, I guess not. So thanks, everyone, for coming to the session. And um, hope you guys uh, have a great uh, rest of your afternoon. OK, thank you, Argan. Thank you. Thank you.